from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everyone. It's such a beautiful day, and you all are such a beautiful sight <laughs> to look at. Welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm Betsy Peterson, the director of the American Folklife Center here. And I'm not going to talk too long, because the staff of the center is going to talk about our collections and the work that we do in greater detail. But uh, the leadership of NABS approached us last spring um, to talk about what we could do and how we could work together um, for your conference. And so we're really excited. We've been um, meeting with Dylan Pritchard for several months and talking with him on the phone. So I hope we've got a good program here for you today. But I think given the title or theme of the conference in the tradition, I think you've come to the right place. <laughs> I would certainly hope so. And I, and I think we have a lot of materials, a lot of primary resources that can inform um, and connect with the work that you do, with the stories that you tell. And actually, I think Zora Neale Hurston has about the best definition of folklore ever, um, which is folklore is the boiled down juice of human living. And I think that kind of about sums it up. Um, so we do have that boiled down juice here. And, and please come back and come back often. Um, before I turn it over to the staff, I just wanted to say one word, um, uh, just a, a note of remembrance um, about a colleague, friend, mentor, Gladys Marie Fry, who I know many of you knew. She was a great friend to folklore. Um, and a great mentor to many folklorists as well. She's a professor at the University of Maryland, um, has, been, has written two fabulous books, Night Riders and Black Folk History, and Stitch from the Soul, uh, Slave Quilt from the Antebellum South. And we're very sad to hear of her passing. We know you are too, but we know her spirit is with us here today and I think throughout your gathering. So with that said, I'm going to turn this over to Todd Harvey, um, the curator, one of the curator reference librarians here at the American Folklife Center, and actually two words. There are, there are cups water in the back. Please get some water if you need some. I know some of you have found the restrooms, but if you um, need to find the restrooms, talk to some of our staff and we'll get you all set up and hi there <laughs> okay um todd harvey good morning good morning i take the podium in gratitude and i think that you know why it's because we work in the same field and that is uh preserving tradition and continuing tradition and I do it from my place, which is to take care of the stuff, and you do it out there in the world. And we're all part of the same process. Um, I have a few words that I think will help us uh, focus um, on, the, on the talks today. And uh, I get to talk about the, um, the Library of Congress, which is the oldest federal institution is a cultural institution, the world's preeminent reservoir of knowledge providing unparalleled integrated resources to Congress and the American people. That's the big bull, the American people. Founded in 1800, the library seeks to further human understanding and wisdom by providing access to knowledge through its magnificent collections. So we are the largest library in the world, which means we have the largest collections of storytelling in the world by default. And most of those are here at the American Folklife Center. So let me tell you, the American Folklife Center was created in 1976 by an act of Congress. Through programs of research, documentation, archival preservation, reference service, live performance, exhibits, publications, and training, the American Folklife Center archive established by the Library of Congress Music Division in 1928, 
is now one of the world's largest archives of ethnographic materials from the United States and around the world. Most of our materials and our programs and our services to you are found on our website, and it's a great thing to explore. You can waste hours and hours of time looking at it. I curate the, the Lomax collections here at the American Folklife Center, and um, they are some of, some of the earliest documentation. The Lomaxes ran our archive in the 1930s, and so what I thought I would do, uh, just to start things off, is to um, play a couple of examples of Lomax materials. And this isn't strictly storytelling, but it's, it's, um, it's personal narrative, it's spoken word materials, and I think it'll give you uh, some insight into, into what we have in our collections. And so the, um, the Lomaxes, here's, here's uh, Mr. Lomax, John Lomax, with an unidentified man, maybe some of you know who he is, um, probably in, uh, Somewhere in Georgia, here's, here's the younger Lomax with Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. These guys? Mm -hmm. Recording girls singing in, in, in San Antonio in 1934. Alan Lomax in action in the 1980s, explaining to the world why cultural equity is the way we should all live. So I want to play you an, uh, an example. This is uh, Moe's Clear Rock Platt. Taylor, Texas, 1939. The dust jacket you can see is, is uh, side A, number two, the cat story. Now, we went down, me and Bush boys picked some cotton out here for a farmer, and it was an old log cabin set right on the side of the hill down in Asia's field. So he said, you boys might go down there and stay in that old house. So I went down there and it had an old hawk in it, an old log chimney. And I built me up a farm out of some cotton sticks and some little pieces of rotten wood along the back of the creek. And long about one o'clock that night, the boys said, let's cook some supper and make some coffee. I said, let's leave a will. I put the coffee pot on the farm, and so we began to have a little coffee. And so all at once, on this little shelf sitting back on the west end of the room, just an old fashioned shelf built into the wall, and I looked up down to a great big old black cat standing on there, and his eyes began to turn around just like millstones looking at me. And I told him, look at that strange cat, Yana. And the more we fellas would look at this cat, why the larger it would grow. And so, and finally the cat says, uh, we all here together. I says, yes, we here now, but we won't be here long. And out this wonder we went. <laughs> <laughs> And so we had far for it, and far was plenty good and was fixing to cook for me, and that thing just simply spit that far and put it out, and I just couldn't stand it no longer. So Luke and John and Claire Rock, all of us, we just went out to win and left there. So he places himself in a traditional tale, right? It reminds me of some of the Jack tales, uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of magical cat who appears and disappears in the haunted house. And it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a motif that you find all over American storytelling. Um, but in this case, it's, it's from Texas. And there he is, I guess he was a mule driver. Um, so the next uh, performer I have for you, Alan Lomax called her the greatest voice in American song. Vera Hall from, from Northwestern Alabama, from Livingston area, Alabama. And um, he recorded her in 1948 uh, for about 15 hours. He did oral history with her. And uh, it was the only time I believe she left Alabama. He, he brought up to New York to, to make these recordings. And they recorded her first in, in 1937 and last in 1959. So at the American Folklife Center Archive, we have a lot of Vera Hall recordings. And this is one of her best, The Wild Ox Moan. <laughs> Uh-huh. 
home, don't you howl, please? Uh-huh. Well, I'm going up the country. Uh-huh. Don't you want to go? Uh-huh. Well, I'm going out in Texas. Do you hear it? What else more? And if they don't want to suit me, black woman, I'm going to drive my bell car home. Well, my clothes look lonesome uh-huh. Hanging on their line uh-huh. Don't your kitchen feel lonesome uh-huh. Of course the library has Bessie Smith recordings. <laughs> Not today. But you know what, if, if uh, we can certainly help you, you know, when, when you come back. Um, well, I, I know Bessie Smith was, was, uh, was quite famous, but I would uh, I'd listen to Vera Hall uh, along, alongside with her, I think. Um, uh, so I have one more. I, I love that because it, it's, it's improvised, right? And, and, and she's talking about what's happening today and it feels like it could go on as long as it needed to go on. And, and um, do you have a question? Yeah, I, you know what, I understand most of it, but I wasn't quite sure what you were saying. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-
So, that, it's a little warm. Uh, all right, so I, I, um, I can imagine there might be a few questions, but I, I want to, um, Thea says I can take a question or two, um, but we have to move on soon because there are lots of people to talk to you today. Um, we have, oh, sorry. <laughs> nice, <huh? laughs> we have about f just a five minutes to take a couple of questions. Um, and I have a microphone so that it's easy for Todd to hear you. Mm -hmm. Do your recordings have English subtitles? No, they do not. These are archival recordings. These are discs and things like that. This is the real thing. Is there a way to go online to get some of this information? Yes. What, do you, what did you do to go the online? American Folk Life Center website. Oh, that's it? Okay. Thank you. Also, if you look in your packets, um, Dana Bell um, has created one of our amazing staff people here at the Library of Congress has, com has compiled a guide to resources that are online that you can access remotely. She's here at the back of the room um, and she's here, she'll be here during the break. You can ask questions. Dana, can you raise your hand? Here she is. Um, she created this resource guide, so. Mm-hmm, Dana. I, I just wanted to suggest that I, I know that some of the words may be a little bit difficult for understand, but I would hope that most of us can appreciate the sounds and the feeling and the emotion, understanding the period that the people had come through. So I don't think we have to know the exact words. We should hopefully be able to surmise what that whole experience was about. We're from that root. Thank you. Statement. I just want to share a, a quick uh, statement. Um, when I was, I don't know how many of you saw me do Voices of Courage. I did it in, um, let's see, uh, when we were in Little Rock, right? So when I went to study, when I got to Ida B. Wells, I wanted to include folk life, and I wanted to do games. And so when I came to Library of Congress, I looked up Vera Hall, and I couldn't get the exact region, but I got the South. And I used Vera Hall when I played the game song, a courting song. I used Vera Hall's courting song to say that uh, at this age, she would be courting Ida B. Wells, but she couldn't court because her parents died. And I sing that song with the audience, just to let you know how to use this work. Mm -hmm. Hey, so I, I want to uh, answer more questions, but I think it's time for us to move on. I, I'll be here after this. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Hang on just one second, and I'll get you. I don't think I need to say. I, I look around and I see um, so many people here that um, they have these stories and everything, and a lot of our um, elders have made that transition. Is there a way that we can, um, we as a group can start recording our stories so that they can be, they can be found, you know, so that the younger generation, the generation that comes after us can hear. Because like when I heard the Vera Hall, I remember that, I remember my aunt, you know, singing those songs and things to me. I said, Dad, I didn't even know. And I'm a librarian, I didn't even know. So uh, is, how, what is the best way for someone um, to have their stories um, recorded. Do you have any type of program where they can have their stories recorded so it can be added to the archive, to the folk life? Yeah, there, there are ways, and I'll make you a deal. If, if, uh, if you as a group will record your oral histories, we'll put them in the Library of Congress. Um, so, so, look, I, I, I'm yes. going to... Um, also, just to, to let you know that um, our staff member, Guha Shankar, will be talking more about um, field work later on today in this in your sessions, but let's thank Todd Harvey. Yeah, yeah. Well, my my stuff is what you want to hear. Uh, what Megan's going to talk about is what you have to hear. Thank you. Wow, that was a uh, quite a lead-in. Um, thanks, Todd. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Good morning. Um, I don't know that I've ever presented to as enthusiastic an audience as this. 
it's really wonderful and it puts me at ease because I am not a performer whatsoever. So you'll have to bear with me a little bit. Um, and sorry, don't. Okay, great. Um, Todd's presentation was actually a great lead into my presentation because I am from the Veterans History Project. I'm the reference specialist at the Veterans History Project. And we're part of the American Folklife Center here at the library. And it's a project that you can actually, you can take part in and donate stories of veterans. So it's a great lead into the question about how can our stories be part of the library here. All right, let's see. Okay, so in case you don't know about the Veterans History Project, uh, our mission is to collect, preserve, and make accessible the stories of America's war veterans. And we were established by Congress in 2000. And since 2000, we're celebrating our 15th anniversary this year. Since 2000, we've collected over 99,000 individual narratives. So quite a lot. Um, and our emphasis is really on the social and cultural experience not so much the military history experience. Um, we're not so much about charting how battles were won um, and how different regiments took part in a glorious victory. It's really more about what the experience of uh, being in the military was all about, how it felt, how basic training felt, how it felt to leave your family, um, th those sorts of experiential feelings. Um, and we do this by asking the general public so folks such as yourself, to interview the veteran in your life and then donate the oral history to us here at the library. We archive it and make it accessible to researchers who are working on PhD dissertations, um, who are working on documentaries, who might just be wanting to know more about their own family history. We make these stories accessible both uh, in the reading room here at the library as well as online. So in terms of our African-American holdings, stories of African-American veterans, uh, these are some of the photos that we have um, that have been donated to us. All of these folks here have taken part in our project. Um, we have over 3,000 stories of veterans who have self-identified as African-American. Uh, and you can see that out of the 99,000, 3,000 is only a small part. Um, and it really has to do with the fact that we uh, are dependent on the general public not only for the stories, but for the information about the veterans. So we can only count a story if someone has self-identified as African American. Um, this is what we call metadata, and it's really important that we know as much as we can about the veteran um, and their story when they're donated to us. So it's, it's a small fraction. Um, there are more veterans than this that are in our collection, um, but that's the number that we can go with. About 500 the, of these are, are fully digitized and available online, and they span um, every branch, uh, every conflict from World War II to the present, um, including recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, and every rank. So we have some of the more lauded stories from Tuskegee Airmen and Montford Point Marines, and then we have veterans who maybe did never leave the states, who just served stateside, or her served in more administrative roles were, again, interested in all experiences and not just combat roles or storming the beach or in the trenches, but all of the roles. So one of the stories that I wanted to, to show you today, um, I decided to look at two different collections just to give you a taste of what our collections are all about. Uh, the first veteran is James Edward Blakely. He enlisted in the Navy in 1939, and he served as a cook uh, aboard a couple of different ships in the Pacific Theater. Uh, sorry? Yeah, just like Dory Mil Miller, exactly, yeah. Um, and just like Dory Miller, he was stationed at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. So I thought this was a good collection as we approached uh, Pearl Harbor Day. Um, and John, if you could play that first audio clip. So these are, this is part of his collection. About five or six minutes before eight o'clock, the way I was on the USS St. Louis, that's a light, what they call box back, light cruiser. The word came over the loudspeaker, all hands man your bow station, all hands man your bow station. This is not a drill. That was where hell on earth began. It'll have probably 50, 60 men aboard. 
coming back to the ship. And when I looked around, it was a direct hit right in the middle of the Liberty Boat. And in December, in Hawaii, the weather's like summer. And I could see white uniforms, blown sky high. They never made it. I don't have to close my eyes to see that. So you can see that uh, Mr. Blakely's story is maybe different than those that we have in the Lomax collection or those that, that Todd talked to you about, but I think you'll agree that that, that account is uh, equally as important in terms of folk life. Yeah, so that's Mr. Blakely's collection. The next collection that I wanted to show you, it's actually a video collection from Evelyn Clarice Martin Johnson. She was uh, in the Women's Army Corps. She enlisted in 1941, and she served in a postal battalion, which was actually the only Af all African-American female unit to serve overseas. She served in France and England during World War II. Um, and John, if you can play that clip, that would be great. She talks about her experiences overseas. What were your emotions over there with what you did see, though? Well, destruction is heartbreaking to see how the schools, the churches, the entire communities were bombed because the, all of that destruction had not been cleared up or cleaned up. And we saw that daily where we were because they had bombed Birmingham before we had arrived there. And it was the same in Rouen, France. That was what was um, sort of a helping you to wish you were leaving the area and on your way back to America. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Well, you don't forget it. There's no way to forget it. You try not to keep it uh, on your everyday thinking, but you're going to think about it, especially when there is so much similarity of that going on later, like your Vietnam and your Korean War and, and all the other wars. You, you don't forget that. How do people treat you when they find out that they know you're a veteran? Oh, many of them are surprised, and um, then when I say World War II, they, are, they said, where were you? And then I tell them, and they are delighted that I, you know, they appreciate the fact that I did sir. All right, so those are just two of the stories that we have in our collection. They happen to both be from World War II, but like I said, we collect stories from all conflicts and even uh, between wars, so not just limited to um, particular conflicts, particular wars, but anyone who served in U.S. uniform can take part in our project. Um, let's see. All right, so just really quick, a couple of other resources. Uh, like I said, some of our collections are digitized and available on our website, so you can search our website. We have an online database. You can search by by race, by gender, by service location and unit. So if you have family members or if you want to research the particular history of a unit, you can do that with our online database. We also have um, uh, online exhibits. It's a series called Experiencing War. And we release those quarterly on a number of different topics. And we have right now two different online exhibits that pertain to African American veterans. Um, so you can go to our website to see those. Um, and that's all I have for you right now, but I'd, I'd be more than happy to take a couple of questions if there are any. Detroit Public Library is celebrating their sesquicentennial along with the Detroit Police Department. And I wanted to know uh, 
how would I, with assistance through the Library of Congress, set up a, a sesquicentennial blog where people tell the stories and their stories of their community service in the city of Detroit? That's a great question, and it gets towards, um, the question was about um, working with partner organizations such as the Detroit Public Library um, to donate oral histories to us and to the library. Um, and we, we have organizations that donate collections ranging from public libraries to retirement communities to schools from K through 12 and universities, all sorts of organizations. Um, and so I would definitely encourage you to go to the public library and work with the librarians there um, to start your own project. There's um, not anything specific that you need to do. We can get information to you and I can have some of my colleagues who work on the programming into the project work with you. Um, but it's, it's really, if you have the will to start this up in your community, then you can go ahead and do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi. So I remember um, a couple of years ago, um, a student um, tried to do a project with the veterans where they wrote their stories down. And, um, and I know a lot of library systems are trying to do that now and get the veterans to come in. Um, do, do you do a partnership or do you have a program where they, um, they can come together in a group and, and record their stories or write their stories so they can submit it to the um, archives? So, you know, I'm a veteran myself, oh, you know, and I want last of the wax. Um, mine's is from a reserve point of view, but, you know, I think it'd be really important that all those, you know, stories get put in. So if there's a way that we can, um, as a group, can organize to, um, to get the stories in. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, yes, definitely, even as a reservist, your story is very important, and we definitely want it in our archive. And in terms of... Um, Working with community organizations and with students, we have, uh, like I said, a lot of different programs at schools, whether it's um, younger students or older students in universities. Um, generally, we, we need stories to be kind of one-on-one -on -one interviews, but that doesn't preclude having larger programs. Um, and you, I can speak with you after the program uh, about your specific community where you are and see if there are organizations that are already set up doing this. That would be wonderful. Any other questions? Great. Okay, let's thank Megan thank you. for her presentation. Thank you. Um, and we have, um, we have one more staff member, Guha Shankar, is going to come up and talk about the Civil Rights Oral History Project and a, a couple of others. But I, we have a few late arrivals, so if you have an empty seat next to you, could you raise your hand? So we have a seat up here. We have a couple right in here. There's uh, one here. There's one in the front row here. Um, it's a little, there's a, uh, and there, there's a, a seat over here in the front row. Has everybody got a seat? Yet? No? Is that a little tight? Um, you know, actually, there are, two, there are two seats here you could make some. Hmm. OK, so Guha. Um, Actually, are you comfortable? Are you? All right. Okay, so Guha Shankar. Hi, good morning again. Thank you all for being here. It's a privilege to uh, be here in front of you today. Um, I want to thank my colleagues uh, Todd Harvey and uh, Megan Harris for doing such a nice job of setting up my presentation. I have very little to say, so I'm just going to play some clips for you from uh, two of our most substantive collections that document the African-American experience here at the library at the American Folklife Center. Um, if you look in your packets, you will see the URLs for the Civil Rights History Project and the National Visionary Leadership Project. And those are the ones that I'm going to talk about mostly in the time I have here. And um, 
I, I look around and I think I see some familiar faces, so I guess maybe we should start by acknowledging that many of you have actually done research here before, is that correct? Have those of you who visited our reading rooms, raise your hands, please. Excellent, thank you. Well, uh, we welcome all of you, although not at the same time, uh, to come and visit our reading rooms. So make an appointment that your best friend is the librarian, that's us. Um, I also noticed that um, with respect to what Megan has just said about uh, the experiences of uh, service uh, of folks here in the library, and some of you have identified yourselves. Uh, those of you who are members of the uh, Veterans of the Armed Services, please raise your hand. Thank you. And then the other category of folks I wanted to call out, uh, or should give a shout out to, were those of you who were involved in the uh, freedom struggle from the 1950s and 60s and on through today. Thank you. All right, so with regard to that, um, in your packets you'll see, as I said, the URLs for the Civil Rights History Project and the National Visionary Leadership Project. These resources are available to you online uh, in, a, in your own browser in the comfort of your own home. The Civil Rights History Project, the distinction I'll make is that the Civil Rights History Project is available through the uh, uh, website of the Library of Congress, as you can see down here in the corner. And the National Visionary Leadership Project, uh, although the archival materials, the recordings are here uh, at the library, uh, in point of fact, uh, the National Visionary Leadership Project maintains its own website and you can access stories through their website. Have, have you folks visited the National Visionary Leadership Project website? Do you know where that is? Well, you'll find out. Okay, all right. Um, so let me begin first with the Civil Rights History Project. I'm the project director here at the library side for this initiative. Um, it's a joint effort between the library and the Smithsonian's National Museum for African American History and Culture. Uh, and uh, we operate under the mandate uh, of a public law that was passed in 2009 by U.S. Congress. Under the terms of the mandate, the library and the NMAHC were directed to first conduct a survey of existing oral history collections with the relevance to the civil rights movement to obtain justice, freedom, and equality for African Americans, and then to record new interviews with people who participated in the struggle beginning about 2010. The initiative ended in 2014. Uh, to that end, we have, uh, as you will see here, over uh, 100 distinct interviews with members uh, of the struggle, uh, ranging from people who were well-known and famous, like the Reverend Joseph Lowry, uh, to others who were frontline activists, uh, whose work is perhaps not as well-known, but whose stories are compelling nonetheless. Um, and we have over 100 interviews, uh, and some of them, just a, a reference back to an earlier point, some of them are done with multiple people in one setting. Uh, it's a difficult situation to do something like that. And I can talk about that a little later when we talk about the technical aspects of conducting your own documentation. Um, so all these materials are available. One of the nice things about the Civil Rights History Project is that every one of these interviews, unlike others that you might find, not just in the library site, but also uh, across the spectrum of oral history collections, they're all fully transcribed. Um, so you can actually come through here and search for them according to locations of where the interviews were, uh, were done or where they're referencing uh, if events that were important in the struggle, like say Birmingham or Selma, uh, on those other places like St. Augustine, Florida, which are a little less known. Um, and we have uh, these materials, as I said, are available on site. And if you look, for instance, at the subject listing, it'll tell you that these are all the ways in which you can search across the collections and aggregate several interviews will come up in one place so you can search through those individual interviews. And you can also do what is the librarian's best friend now, you can Google it, which has now become a verb, and you can find some of these materials and some of these themes embedded within those transcripts. Um, so I'm going to sort of stop talking now because I think the most important thing that I can do is tell you that the words of um, the elders, uh, the words of uh, the individuals whom we interviewed are paramount. And here I'll make a distinction between I think what uh, Todd and Megan were also talking about. We serve at the library the stuff that is the raw. It's up to you to cook it, right? So what, you, what we're presenting in, in the very nice examples that Megan and Todd presented were extracts from a larger corpus of materials. There's 15 hours of material in the Vera Hall uh, materials, for, in the Vera Hall interviews. Todd pulled together something that 
crystallizes what we think is important about that particular collection that speaks to a certain aspect of the experience. We cannot do the research for you, as you well know, and find out what those nuggets of information are. That's what archival research is in a lot of cases, is digging down, digging deep. Uh, gold doesn't just wash up in the shore or in your pan. You've got to go looking for it. And that means doing all of this work like reading through or looking through over 200 hours of materials in the Civil Rights History Project alone. Um, there are over 300 interviews in the National Visionary Leadership Project and don't even get us started about the Alan Lomax collection. So it's a lifetime worth of work. Um, I certainly made it my lifetime because I've been here a long time, so I'm happy here, but you're all welcome to come and participate with that as well. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, start with the first interview, and this is with Sam Mahone, uh, who was interviewed in Albany, Georgia in 2013. Uh, Sam Mahone is a civil rights activist with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in America's Georgia. He attended Tougaloo College in Art, Institute of Atlanta, worked in several art museums and galleries. In this interview, he discusses his experience of racial segregation discrimination uh, in America's Georgia and uh, the experiences which uh, were on the heels of the passage of the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, how many of you have been to the Civil Rights exhibit here in the library? Well, you all must be from out of town, right? Okay. <laughs> Well, if you haven't done it, go, not now, but go after this presentation, <laughs> go to that exhibition. It's replete with a lot of just fascinating material, uh, artifacts, objects, transcripts, and several oral histories, uh, interviews, uh, not just from our collections, but from collections across the breadth of the, of the uh, library. Uh, you'd find yourself uh, really well suited for that. Um, so I want to play this uh, first clip, which is from Sam Mahone. I finished high school. Uh, and then immediately after that, I joined STIC and uh, began to continue working throughout America's, but I also worked in other counties, surrounding counties as well. Continued doing voter registration, uh, continued doing, um, testing the laws of public ac accommodation and what have you. Uh, I remember the night the Civil Rights Bill was passed, um, we decided we were going to test it at a local restaurant. So this is July 64. Exactly, yeah. Um, myself and John Perdue, I be, who I believe is here, uh, who was one of the America's Four, snake worker. Uh, Bob Mance, uh, out of Morehouse, who recently passed away. Uh, uh, and four of the students, we went down to a place called the Hasty House restaurant. And uh, we sat there and we ordered, uh, we tried to order the food, but no, the waitress never came. Um, one of us, one of the guys who were with us decided that he needed to go to the restroom. And uh, the restroom was outside. You had to go outside and go around to the side of the building. Well, while we were waiting, uh, no one came to take our order, but about 10 minutes past, we noticed that he hadn't come back from the restroom. So, uh, we finally get up, decided to get up and leave. And as we get up to leave to go to the car, we were met by a group of, of whites who had come across the street from a service station with tire irons, tire irons and, uh, and baseball bats. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they wait until we get into the car, which was a convertible car. And uh, then they just rain down on the car with baseball bats and tire irons and beat us on top of our heads. And uh, we finally get the car started and we just, we get out of there without the guy who had gone to the restroom. Well, he shows up about two days later and, uh, and he says what happened was that when he went to the restroom, he was attacked and beaten and he just ran off and never came back. And so, uh, uh, but that was the first uh, uh, evening we decided to test the, the laws of public accommodation. So that's that moment of deep personal experience, which, and this is a person operating from 50 year memory, and I think many of you might have similar memories of, of an experience which has burned so deeply into you that you recount it as though it were there yesterday. And I'd be interested in finding out how uh, and what way storytellers craft these kinds of personal experiences into stories for your own use and for sharing more widely with the uh, world outside. The second clip is from Bill Saunders. Um, who was born in New York, New York. Uh, he married Henrietta Jenkins and had 10 children. 
Uh, Mr. Saunders attended Southern Business College, Southern Illinois University, vocational education, and the University of Nevada. He worked as a politician and was also the CEO of the Committee on Better Racial Assurance Human Services Agency. He was interviewed for this project down in South Carolina. And in this interview, um, he recalls serving in the Army during the Korean War and speaks of his experiences with racism in the National uh, Army at that time. And I think those of you who have relatives and have spoken to members of our, in a, uh, of our uh, service people, and uh, particularly of that era, will know how deeply those experiences influenced uh, their subsequent activism in the freedom struggle. And uh, so I want to play this particular clip from Mr. Saunders. You confronted more racism in Hawaii than you had encountered in, in, on John's Island or in Charleston. Even. Hawaii and the military, even in Korea. Yeah. Uh, racism was real, real bad in Korea, but and in, in, in Hawaii, and I just realized later on, they were, it was right after 1951, they had just really integrated the army. Mm -hmm. There were four blacks in the, our company, with one Hispanic, one in Indian, and uh, we, we were the really, and I didn't realize until many years later that um, all of these people, poor white men, who also had a lot of problems, mm -hmm. and the only place that they could vent any of those problems was on, was on people like me. So they had their own own problem reason and we had a lot of fights with that. What kinds of, I mean, do, do you remember particular instances of? Oh, I've had physical fights and, you know, a, a guy would beat me, but I, I, my grandmother told me I had such a bad temper. I get real mad. I don't, I don't give up. So I don't stop when people say to stop. So I end up being the one getting, getting in trouble. Um, but they did so many things to um, the blacks. We had one guy, one of my best friends who died recently, um, we made him dig a, dig a six by six by six hole and the, the, the sergeant drop a dime in it and then make him close it up. You know, those are the kinds of stuff that we went through. Uh, and it, it, it's a lot of it uh, coming back to me more and more now. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's having a lot of flashback with that. Even in Korea in the war, I mean, the guy, my first sergeant who I didn't know um, on, on the front of the line, we just fought for two days and I was going up the hill on top, and he said, "Your black son, bitch, if you can't pay, I blow your brains out." And he had a forty-five on me, and I decided at a point I was carrying a, my rifle was in the hole, and I was going to roll and get my gun, you know, like you saw some of the movies. And I said, "That, that hole, that forty-five blow hole straight through you," because I'd seen forty-five shot people with the hole back out. I, I went back to my hole and stayed there. When it was time for us to leave, he sent for me and said that um, had made me lead the whole company out and because being in front you get killed first so he wanted to make sure that that was in front going out um, and those kinds of stuff so there's a lot of stuff that um, that we can laugh about because if you don't you cry about it uh, so but the racism is just really heavy and coming back even into California when we got back as heroes because I got wounded and we were there in California and they um, start calling out the white soldier's name, and then they call the black soldier. I never understood that until we got on. But black and white soldiers couldn't ride in the same train coach across America, so you had to ride in separate coaches. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, uh, wrap this up because I want to make sure that I have some time for questions. The other uh, collections that I might sort of point you to, and uh, my colleague Kathy Kirsch will talk about some of these a little later, but um, in your, again, in your packet, you will notice a URL for Born in Slavery, uh, Slave Narratives from the Federal Writers Project. And this is more than 2,300 first-person accounts of slavery and also photographs of former slaves. And these narratives were collected in the 1930s as part of the Federal Writers uh, Project of the Works Progress Administration, a federal project, by the way, and assembled and microfilmed in 1941 as uh, the Slave Narratives, which is this mammoth 17-volume set um, uh, uh, published and uh, available to you. And the online collection, I think, might be interesting for you all because it actually has facsimiles of all of the various narratives that have been uh, digitized and put up online, so you can scan those. They're not, uh, they have some subject terms and so on, but they're not fully transcribed as are the Civil Rights History Project. So uh, with that, I'm going to bring this to a close, and thank you for your patience. Uh, I know it's already been a little long, but uh, We'll, we'll move on. Um, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them either here or afterwards. In which way are you connected with Story Corps? Because they have been going around, you know, collecting stories. And I've even, Bob, joined in telling people about it. 
Um, StoryCorps is archived here. The materials, uh, the recordings are archived here at the library, the American Folklife Center. Again, um, you can get access to those. It's an enormous volume of stories, so we can provide online access to all of them. But if you make an appointment with our library staff, with our uh, American Folklife Center reference staff, you all can come in and listen to those stories. And some of them, as you know, are available in bits and pieces here and there. That's the nuggets that get extracted by NPR for their programs as well. So that's one way to do it. And participation is an interesting one. We can direct you to the StoryCorps site and tell you when the mobile trucks and buses show up in your area. And you, you might want to think about working out a, in a way to uh, get, get your stories or you know, people whose individuals whose stories you think are important into those particular, into that archive. Yes, yes ma'am, right, right behind you. I wanted to share with the NABs that Mary Carter Smith and Victoria Smith <laughs> were recorded by StoryCorps, and it, so they are here right. with you. Yes. Thank, thank you very much for, for, for your contributions. Appreciate it. <laughs> oh, sorry. All right. Oh, one more question. And then we'll take a break. Uh, next year in 2017 will be the 50th anniversary of the Detroit riot or rebellion. And I wanted to know how you could set up, would it be possible to set up a StoryCorps bus or whatever at that time? Uh, that would be a very good question, and we can refer you to the StoryCorps folks. They might actually be in partnership with the local organizations in Detroit to do something like that already. Um, I guess that's one of the things I want to mention to you is that we're the National Library, but we're not quite the National Mafia. You know, we <laughs> really believe that our local partners are every bit as important in the collecting efforts that you all do, so we would encourage you uh, strongly to contact your local libraries. They are uh, the community centers at their very best, and they are places that your stories uh, can be uh, collected, uh, they can help you with documentation efforts, and they can help you find stories. Um, and that's really what we say is that uh, the library is in your backyard, and it's one of the most, one of the greatest resources that we have, and we are always proud to partner with those folks to do precisely the kinds of efforts you're talking about. Okay. Okay. So let's come back at thank you 10:40, and we'll hear you'll hear more about the collections at the Library of Congress. Thank you. of cheers that this person is no stranger to y'all association. <laughs> so this was a recording of um, Linda at this National Storytelling Festival somewhere in the 1970s, and I'm glad that you enjoy that. Good morning, I am Val Morris, and I'm a processing activist here at the, at the American Folklife Center. And actually, I want to put that, um, my, I want to piggyback of, off of something that my, my um, colleague Guha said about, you know, like, we are um, archives and we just like, you know, like it's up to, we give the raw materials and, you know, it's up for y'all to find the gold. And Linda was, uh, Miss Goss was actually here a couple of years ago um, as she had won one of our um, grants. And she actually was able to research and she was able to enrich our collections even more because she was able to fill in some of the gaps and the questions that I had about the National Storytelling Festival. So that's just like, you know, like a, another plug for y'all to come in and do some research here at our American Folklife Center. Okay, so I would like to personally welcome all of y'all and every single member of NAPS to the Library of Congress, to the American Folklife Center, and to DC. I'm really excited here this morning to be able to share some of the wonderful storytelling resources that you have just seen from, uh, you're about to see from my colleagues and you're about to see from me that are actually housed here at the American Folklife Center. Some of these resources are not just on paper or what we call manuscript materials, but they are sound recordings, they are graphic images, you know, um, photos and uh, prints and stuff, and moving images. 
Um, we have also digitized a large amount of these materials, and we're working on digitizing another set. And some of these um, that are not digitized, you can also digita um, you could also request, and we could do it um, for you on demand. Um, today, I will share some of the recordings that um, are both sound and moving images that are part of story collections here at the American Folklife Center. The first one is the, J the first one is the James Cabotton collection, and then the other would be the International Storytelling Collection. The earliest recordings of American folk tales that we have in our archives were actually done on wax. Um, rec cylinder recording. So just imagine like a candle with a hole in it and they had grooves in there. <laughs> that's like, and that's, uh, um, that's, a, that's one of the, the, one of the, the, um, the earliest recordings that we have um, of song recordings. And these were made in the 1930s by Harvard trained scholar from Mississippi, a person by the name of James Madison Carpenter. Um, Carpenter was best known for his ballads and um, songs, and he played, um, and he collected a lot of um, stories in England, Scotland, and Wales. However, he was a, also a teacher at Duke University, um, and is, that's where he identified a janitor there by the name of John. And these became important because they were the earliest known field recordings of African American folk tales within the United States. I'm going to play you a brief sample of James Wax's um, cylinder recording of John telling the story of Jack and the Devil. So you imagine that these are some old recordings, so the quality is not gonna be that great, but if you listen clearly, you will hear when he begins, once upon a time, there was a boy named Jack. Once upon a time, there was a boy by the name of Jack. Jack was gambling and he gambled all of his days. Up till he come to be going about. So he got so desperate in gambling. Till the people in the world told him that they were Jack he gambled so much that uh, I believe he sold his death to the devil. I think if you don't quit gambling, the devil is coming on to the side there and he gets you. So Jack continued on to gamble. Everybody he played with ran the game. Everybody he played with so much because he thought to himself, well, I can just beat anybody I meet. So finally, in stage one, at last, he met the devil one day. The devil says to him, hello, Jack, hi, Mr. Devil. Says, Jack, you want to play a game of cards? He yes, asked, sir, yeah, I'll play it. So, well, Jack says, uh, pay you for $5 a game. So, all right, Mr. Devil, Jack had $15. Of course, he said it back. Man, he went to played it as the devil, and the devil won the first game, that was a five, first five. He won the next game, that was the next five. He won the next game, he says, Jack, the now Jack, the what all the money you got. The now I'll play you for your life. The now Jack, how much you got in your life? The now I'll allow you fifteen dollars for your life. It's all right, the devil. So he put up his life in fifteen dollars, and the devil won that. All right, I know that wasn't the best, but um, we have a lot of these recordings um, in our J James Carpenter collections just waiting to be discovered by you. Um, Carpenter col completed his field recordings and manuscripts. Um, uh, his complete um, field recordings and manuscripts are online, um, will be online in 2016 as part of the digital archives, the full English hosted by the English Folk and Song Society in London. Okay, the International Story Collection is one of our largest collection that we received here in 2001. It was actually 500,000 items came. Um, and it documents the beginning of the International Storytelling Center and all the different variations that it had. And of course, you know, it hosts the International Storytelling Festival and have featured many um, black storytellers over the ages. Mary Catherine Smith, Linda Goss, Jackie Torrance, Charlotte Blake Alston, which I think I saw, see her down there, um, Donna Washington, Brother Blue, Len Cabral, Paul Keynes Douglas, and that's just to name a few. We have many, many others in the collection. 
Um, in 2001, we actually digitized um, the reel-to-reel -reel song recordings, which documents the beginnings of the festival right up to in the 1990s. And then we continued to digitize um, the dats which came, which kind of like took up from that era, right up to the 2000s. Um, now we see, we, now we receive um, a lot of the, the storytelling um, stories on hard drives, so we just like upload them um, di um, directly to our servers. The collection is an open collection, which means that we will receive, we have a, a, a corporate agreement with them, so we receive their, collect, um, their materials every three years for the life of the center and of the festival. Um, in 2012, in an effort to celebrate the 40th anniversary with the International Storytelling Center, we at the American Folklife um, digitized a set of tapes and we put it all together and um, we produced a, a piece entitled Echoes from the National Storytelling Festival. So I opened um, with Linda Goss, as you saw, and that was part of this piece. And now I'm going to close with another um, icon to the Storytelling Festival. Um, her name is Jackie Torrance. Um, and I would like to thank you for your patience. And enjoy DC and enjoy the Library of Congress. And we're looking forward to serving you more. Now, Brill Rabbit was a fine fisherman. All he had to do was go down to the river, drop his pole in, and within sight of 10 minutes, he'd have 20 fish right up there on the bank. He was a good fisherman. Brer Rabbit had a good friend, his best friend, in fact, whose name was Brer Raccoon. But Brer Rabbit called him Brer Coon for short. Brer Coon couldn't fish at all. He didn't even like fish. What he liked was frogs. Brer Coon would go down to the river with a big tow sack and he'd fill that sack full of frogs and he'd take them home to his wife and his wife would say, Woo! <laughs> frogs. <laughs> <laughs> now, Brer Coon loved frogs. But the frogs was getting tired of Brer Coon catching them. So they had a big frog meeting. <laughs> they said, we's got to do something about Brer Coon. He's coming down here and catching us. We got to find out where he is and when he's coming. So they decided to put a lookout frog on the bank. They needed a frog with big eyes. <laughs> frog that could hear good from a long way. A frog that could see real good, see him a coming. The only frog they could see with them qualifications was the bullfrog. So they put him down on the riverbank to watch for Brer Coon. Brer Coon would get a half a mile down to the river and the bullfrog would see him. And the bullfrog would warn all the rest of the frogs. And you could hear him say, here he comes. Here he comes. Here he comes. And the little frogs would echo what the bullfrog had said. Here he comes. Here he comes. Here he comes. Well, by the time Brer Coon got to the river, all the frogs had leaped into the water. And there wasn't a frog in sight, and old Brer Coon couldn't go in the water because he couldn't swim. He'd go home with that empty toe sack, and his wife would say, is you coming in here without a frog? <laughs> <laughs> and Brer Coon would say, now wait a minute, I can't catch them frogs. They done got too wild to catch. I done been down there, and every time I go down there, all you can hear is, here he comes, here he comes, here he comes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy Kirst. I'm a folklorist and archivist in the American Folklife Center, and I'll be talking to you about some of the Zora Neale Hurston materials that we have in our archive and also elsewhere in the Library of Congress. We are thrilled to have you here, really pleased. In 1938, Zora Neale Hurston wrote an essay called Folklore and Music, intended to be published in a work called The Florida Negro. In it, she wrote, 
as Betsy has already said, folklore is the boiled down juice of human living. It does not belong to any special time, place, nor people. In folklore, as in everything else that people create, the world is a great big old serving platter, and all the places are like eating plates. Whatever is on the plate must come out of the platter, but each plate has a flavor of its own, because the people take the universal stuff and season it to suit themselves. And this local flavor it is, what, is what is known as originality. She wrote so beautifully, Known by many as a literary figure, a gifted author, Hurston was also an astute and perceptive ethnographer and interviewer. She studied anthropology at Columbia University in the mid-20s, where she was encouraged to travel to her native Florida to gather African-American folklore, which she did. The American Folklife Center holds a variety of fascinating Hurston materials relating to this research. Our Hurston collections include, for the most part, audio recordings that she collected from individuals or groups or were made of her own speaking and singing in Florida and Georgia in 1935, in Haiti in 1936, in Washington, D.C. at the National Folk Festival in 1938, and during her work for the Federal Writers Project in Florida in 1938 and 39. We also have a few um, letters in our collection. Here is a photo of Hurston, which we believe was taken at a recording site in 1935. The photo uh, resides in the prints and photographs division here at the library. It was really hard to decide what audio recordings to play for you, since so much of it is so compelling. I've chosen three selections from the late 1930s that feature Hurston speaking and singing and demonstrate her ethnographic eye and documentary style. In April of 1938, Hurston joined the staff of the Florida Federal Writers Project to collect African American folklore in Florida. The Federal Writers Project was part of the Works Progress Administration where authors, historians, artists, and folklorists like Hurston were hired to collect folklore history, oral narratives, songs, and more to document the lives of ordinary Americans from many backgrounds. As part of her work, Hurston collected folk speech, work songs, tall tales and lies, narratives about preachers, children's games, and much more. I'm focusing today on the recordings where you get a chance to hear Hurston's voice and experience her method of documenting folk culture. These recordings are all on the Library of Congress's website. Oh, this is a description of traveling. Uh, now, when the men are lining, they put the rail down, and then, of course, the captain, he squats straddle of it and uh, looks down it so he can tell when it's lined up in, in, in uh, exact line with the others. And if the carrot, well, he'll say, uh, shove it over. Uh, and the carrot too far, he'll say, send it back. And when they get it exactly in line, he'll tell them, join it ahead. But they uncorrupted that to join ahead. And all of them said, join ahead, for join it ahead. And uh, so uh, this song is uh, about a lining. And the rhythm goes with it. They put, the, they put this uh, lining bar, this long steel bar, crowbar, between the legs and, uh, and and so they have greater purchase and pull back on it. Well, wait a minute, they pull back, how are they facing in relation to the rail? They, that back is to the rail. In, in, other, in, other words, in other words, they're, they're pulling up on the bar. Pulling up on the bar. They don't have to look at the rail because that's the captain's job to see when it's uh, uh, right. Well, what do they do? do, they, do, they, do they, how, do they, how do they get under the, under the rail? They just push the flange of this, this lining bar under the rail and then pull back on it. Do they, look, do they have to look back at it? Or do they you can hear Herbert Halpert, one of the other Federal Writers Project workers, asking all sorts of questions. So Zora was interested in documenting how things were done sometimes in traditional culture. And the next um, recording is Shove It Over, which is actually the work song that goes along with the track lining, sort of in a call and response chant used um, on the railroad. This song they call Shove It Over, and it's a line and rhythm pretty generally distributed all over Florida. It was sung to me by Charlie Jones on a railroad construction camp near Lakeland, Florida. About how long ago? Uh, that, I gathered that in 33, 1933. 
When I get in the Illinois, I'm going to spread the news about the Florida boys. Shove it over. Hey, 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 you catch a line it. Oh, shaka, laka, 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 laka. <clears throat> can't you move it? Hey, 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 oh, can't you try? Eat him up, whiskers, or he won't shave. Eat him up, body lights, he won't bathe. Shove it over. Hey, 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 oh, can't you line it? Oh, shaka, laka, 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 laka. <clears throat> can't you move it? Hey, 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 can't you try? And here is Uncle Bud, which is a social song, a body juke song sung by Hurston. It was collected by Stetson Kennedy, who is recording her, and whose voice you also hear on, these rec on this recording, um, 1939 in Jacksonville. Uncle Bud is, is not a work song, it's a sort of social song for amusement, and it's so widely distributed, it's growing all the time by incremental repetition, and it is uh, known all over the South. No matter where you go, you can find verses of Uncle Bud. And uh, it's their favorite song, and the men get to working in every kind of work, and they just yell down on Uncle Bud, and nobody particularly needs it. Everybody puts in his verse when he gets ready. And uh, Uncle Bud grows and grows and grows. Uh, what is it, it is sung before the the, uh, the respectable ladies? Never. It's one of those juke songs. And the woman that they sing Uncle Bud in front of is a juke woman. <laughs> and, of course you heard it from women. Yes, I heard it from women. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Uncle Bud's a man. And a man like this, he can't get a woman going to use his fist. Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud. Oh, I'm going to town, going to hurry back. Uncle Bud's got something I sure do like. Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud. Oh, little cat, big cat, a little bit of kitten, gonna whoop their tails if they don't stop shitting. Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud. Uncle Bud's got corn, the show needs chucking. Uncle Bud's got gals, the show needs fucking. Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud. You can hear the rest of it online. <laughs> So I have a few photographs from the Prints and Photographs Division. Um, these are from Hurston's 1935 research with Eatonville, Florida children documenting their games and songs. With the field research done by Hurston and other researchers in the 1930s during, during the New Deal era, the lives, music, speech, memories, and artistic efforts of ordinary Americans were documented. The Library of Congress holds a huge amount of New Deal materials. And in the American Folklife Center, we are honored to also house a wealth of this material, including these and other stunning examples of Hurston's voice, vitality, wit, and deep cultural understanding. The Hurston recordings I played for you, plus many more, are accessible online at the library's website. And on the handout in your packet, you will find a finding aid to Zora Neale Hurston materials throughout the library, manuscript division, prints and photographs, and so on. I recommend that you explore them. And now I want to talk very briefly about voices from the days of slavery, former slaves tell their stories. So if you go to the American Folklife Center homepage, and look at all of the online collections. There are quite a few. There is Voices from the Days of Slavery. And I just urge you to take a look at this site. This site includes seven hours of recorded interviews that took place between 1932 and 1975 in nine southern states. On these recordings, 23 persons were interviewed, born between 1823 and the early 1860s. In the interviews, they discussed how they felt about slavery, about slaveholders, the coercion of slaves, their families, and about freedom. 
the variety of topics, personal experiences, and feelings that are conveyed are incredibly moving and quite remarkable, being able to actually hear their voices and all. Included in the collection is an interview that Hurston took part in with Wallace Quarterman in 1935 in Georgia. This whole collection of audio recordings is available here on this site, and it includes transcriptions of the narratives to help in understanding dialect and in understanding some of the older recordings that are a little scratchy. Anyway, thank you, thank you so much for coming. It's, it's a pleasure having you here, and we urge you to come and visit us. There's a lot to explore. Thank you very much. Hello again. All right, this is uh, going to be the uh, uh, high-speed version of how to conduct uh, audio documentation or uh, cultural documentation. Um, before we do that, I wanted to make a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank a couple of people who have not been acknowledged so far, but first and foremost, our events production coordinator, Thea Austin, who put this program together for you. Oh, there she is right there. And Dana Bell, who's in the back, who put together the wonderful list of resources for you. And many others, too numerous uh, to a name at this particular point. Um, by rights, this next session, which I'm going to do at top speed in about 15 minutes, with leaving some time for questions, um, is generally the focus of uh, various training programs that we conduct at the library through various institutional partners uh, across the country to uh, orient people uh, like yourselves uh, who wish to do cultural documentation in your communities for various purposes, whether it's for uh, podcasts, uh, whether it's for collecting stories of uh, elders and community members, uh, class projects, and so on. And the things that we often get asked uh, go along the lines of how do I do it, what equipment do I use, and how do I do interviews. I'm going to concentrate on those three things because it's a, it's a project, it's a, a topic which, as I said, uh, covers about three weeks in duration when we teach our annual field schools. Uh, this is not for the faint-hearted. As How many of you here have done uh, collecting oral history interviews yourselves? Well, you know, I, I should get you all to come up here and like and do this, do this talk. <laughs> uh, but I think they will tell you that be prepared, be careful, and be cautious about what you are embarking on. It's uh, not a project for the faint of heart. Uh, our colleague Todd Harvey very generously uh, said that he would take the documentation that you're going to collect. Uh, I will caution you that uh, while we are welcoming of collections, we also are acutely aware, uh, given where we stand in terms of trying to archive and sustain these materials, and the sustainability is a key word for us. When we say sustain, we mean not just to you know, have these stories accessible you know, the day after you record them and so on, but generations down the line. The recordings that you have here from the Lomaxes, uh, from the Civil Rights History Project, from the Federal Writers Project, and so on, have stood the test of time because there is a body of people and there's an entire institution devoted to making sure that these materials are available and accessible to you. I do not believe, unless you are really well-funded trust fund hippies, that you've got that kind of manpower and resources at your disposal. Uh, that's where the library and other institutions in your community come into play. Um, but even, even then, even with all of our interest in maintaining and preserving your collections, there are certain things that we would ask that you do in terms of making sure that your materials are going to be available and accessible over the course of time. Um, one of the things that we ask in the first place is understand what the parameters of your project are, uh, to take inventory of the resources that you have so that you can then uh, embark upon a project of cultural documentation and interviewing very carefully. Uh, one of the things I will show you uh, here is on our website. Uh, this particular thing is called the Cultural Documentation Methods and Techniques, I meant site. And, what, and within the site, we have provided some basic guidelines and best practices documents that you may wish to consult. There are many of these around the country. Many institutions like Baylor's Oral History Association have similar sets of guidelines. 
uh, the Smithsonian Institution's Folk Life Programs, uh, Center for Folk Life and Cultural Re and Heritage Research, has their own set of rubrics and best practices. We generally bring these materials together from our colleagues across these institutions because we've been at it for a long time and our roles as ethnographers, as folklorists, as anthropologists, as ethnomusicologists, and we always lean upon our colleagues to keep us abreast of best practices. So one of the things I would urge you to do is when you get to the site and you are interested in trying to figure out what the parameters of such projects are, is to go to this link here, you'll see, called Cultural Documentation Guidelines. And within that, you have various aspects of what the, the broad categories are that one uh, needs to think about when engaging in cult projects of cultural documentation. Um, some of these are more relevant to you than others. I'm not planning on going through all of them. But one of the very first things that we suggest is that you actually do a project plan, right? And what we're asking you to do, again, is take an inventory of the resources that you have. Um, if you don't already have equipment, if you don't already have a place to uh, have these materials rest, then you're going to have to think about it at the head end. Um, many a project runs afoul of one very basic thing. Nobody thought through what the end result was going to be and where it was going to live. They, people come to this project and they say, we're going to document uh, this particular community member or these particular community members because there's an urgency. You get halfway through the project and you find that you, know, you don't know where to store them. You find that you don't have uh, an idea of what sorts of topics you might want to you know, embark upon. You have a broad idea, but the specific historical facts are not available to you. Um, you're, you find out that your technical needs are inadequate to the kind of the subject matter at hand. So this is a very simple spreadsheet that um, uh, our colleagues, Paula Johnson at the uh, Smithsonian Institution, she's a curator there and a folklorist, and our own David Taylor, who used to work with us here at the uh, Library of Congress does, uh, has have put together several years ago, and I've modified this over the course of time. But it asks you to take account of very basic things like a budget, what are your goals, what other kind of research has been done? Do you have a body of materials to draw upon? Would you need to consult, for instance, an international storytelling collection to figure out if the people whom you want to interview have already been interviewed? Or if they've been interviewed and they've been documented, is there something else in the historical record that needs fleshing out? So thorough research is one of the things that we ask you to do. And let me just precisely ask you, where are you going to do the work? Is it a national collecting project like this in the Civilized History Project? Probably not. I mean, you're going to have money for funding, and, and we have to have funding for travel and so on. Uh, so maybe it's in your backyard. One of the things we ask you is, are you planning on what sort of documentary uh, uh, documentation are you going to do? Is it audio recording? In my view, this is the best and the simplest method of recording stories. Uh, video recording and videotaping, it looks great, looks sexy, you know, all high def and all of that. Uh, if you don't have the expertise to do that, you're going to have to bring some people in who can help you do that documentation. That adds to the resources that you're going to need, that adds to the money, right? You're going to have to get equipment, you're going to have to buy it, you're going to have to rent it, you're going to have to do something with it. Even if you were to work in partnership with a particular uh, institution, you're going to have to understand what their technical limitations are, who they can lend to the project, and so on. Are you going to do photography? Photographs, images, as Kathy and others have shown you, are really important to, pl to give a, f a, f a face to the voices that you hear online or anywhere else. And all of these materials, all of these kinds of uh, very detailed uh, uh, things that we're asking you to consider are important because they will play a part in how well and how, sus how well sustained your materials are going to be in an archival situation. I do not believe that I've heard the, a young lady over here ask a question about recording, that the stories that she wants to collect are going to just live in the here and the now. Again, I go back to that point earlier. You're trying to make these publicly available and accessible to generations of people that come after you. You do that to your, to your storytelling. Consider the fact that the materials that you collect, the documentation, the first-hand experiences that you collect have to live. If they don't live, then they don't enter public memory. They don't enter American historical consciousness. So it's up to you, because you guys are mediating between the voice of that person whom you're collecting and everybody else in this room and people you don't even know, right? That's the generational aspect of all of this. So think through all of these questions very carefully. Now, let me see if I can, I'm not even sure. 
The, so that's the project plan is available again online in this, partic in this uh, particular website. Second thing we get asked is what equipment do we want to use? The Library of Congress, being a public institution, can neither confirm nor deny that there are better grades of equipment than others, although I could tell you that <laughs> off camera somewhere. So we rely again on our colleagues like Doug Boyd, um, who is uh, the director of the Oral History Association's uh, Oral History in the Digital Age Project. And this to me is one of the great uh, tools. Um, I keep hoping for the day and keep toying with the idea that there might be a similar set of uh, rubrics that we could use for video recording. Video recording is a whole nother animal. Uh, what we're dealing here with is almost a transparent interaction in terms of audio recording between you as the collector and the person that you're recording. There's not a lot of equipment. There are not a lot of people trailing wires behind them, as is the case with video. You don't have to have a video operator. You can, with practice, get really good at conducting an interview, a story collecting project with just you and the person that you wish to document. And to that end, people say, hmm, what kind of equipment should I get? And we say, well, you know what you do? You go in here and you go to this particular website. This is the Oral History in the Digital Age uh, site. And right here is this thing called Go to Ask Doug. And digital expert Doug Boyd, fellow folklorist, oral historian, and uh, all around good guy has done this really, really neat thing here. And what he says is, it's very simple. It's radio buttons and check boxes. If I can do it, you can do it, right? And basically it says things like, goes back to your project planning. How much money do you have to get a recorder, right? He asks you questions like quality. What is it you want to do with this? Is it professional level quality? Are you the person who's facile with technical equipment that you can say, I want the best and the brightest, the latest? Then you check this box which says professional quality. Uh, but you still want to keep it somewhere in the well, $500 range. And, you want to, and, and then Doug very helpfully has told you that he considered this his best in class. This is something that people like Doug can do. That is to say, they can actually put their hands on pieces of equipment. And I can guarantee you that you have some assurance that it is what he says it is. It, what he says is in the box will actually be what's delivered to you. Um, one of the things we often say is that uh, you know that people are lying when they tell you they have archival quality CDs and DVDs. No such thing, right? So, but you, with this kind of, th with this uh, particular project, you can understand, as Doug says, that there are these classes of recorders, and every one of them comes with an explanation of what the equipment is, what it does, tells you where to go buy them, right? Making sense? Right? So that's one of the recommendations that we would have. So mark this down if it's not already in your package, prepared very nicely by Dana. Right? We can come back to this in just a second. And I'm, whoops, what happened here? Hang on a second. I, I would like to get back. Yes, thank you. All right. And let me go back to one more uh, particular aspect of this. Uh, website. So, so far we talked about project planning, understanding what you want to do and who you want to do it with and so on. We talked about ba very basic equipment and now comes what happens when you go to the actual uh, interview situation. And those of you who've, uh, this should be no surprise to those of you who've done cultural documentation, who've done interviews, but one of the things we do is we say these are best practices and guidelines for conducting recorded interviews. Um, and not all of these are going to come up in your particular situation, but check these out, you know, sort of take them to heart and understand what they are in terms of your own particular documenting, documentary situation. Um, we just go through a list of stuff. It's not a template, it's not the Bible. We're not saying you gotta follow it from in a, in a point one to point 20 or whatever, but this enables you to get the story and the voices of people that you're wanting to document in a, as clear and as concise and as precise a fashion as possible. Um, and above all, uh, one of the things that we say is right here. That, I think, is probably more germane, as germane to you all as anything else. And all it says is you're not just after the facts. You want stories, narratives, and explanations, right? You are storytellers yourselves. 
So you just have to figure out how to mesh you know, the things that you do with the people whom you're talking to and elicit those stories so that it makes sense for you and for all of us who will hear it later on. Okay? So my 10 minutes are up, and I think the buses are about to come, but I will be happy to take some. Yes, ma'am. Oh, it just says avoid questions. This is a guideline. It just says avoid questions that can be answered with a yes or a no. You're not just after the facts. You want stories, narratives, and explanations. That and many more, many other helpful tips are available on this guide. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, Guha Shankar. You can get a hold of me here at gshunker at loc.gov. Any other questions? G I don't have 125 of them, sorry. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Some of the pictures we have online, uh, they are, some of them are in the public domain and can be used, but some of them we ask that you figure out the provenance of each collection because they're not, they are copyrighted by the donors, and there's also user and performer rights that you want to be aware of. Uh, and a lot of cases that we ask, even if they've been donated to the library, that as a courtesy, you contact the performer, uh, the, the person whose image comes up in those photographs and or their uh, estates, just as a courtesy to say, can we use this in our own, uh, in our own work? Okay? Anything else? G-S-H-A-N-K-A-R, G Shankar. First name's Guha, G-U-H-A, at loc.gov. Or you can just get me through folklife at loc.gov. And all that information is available on our website uh, right at the uh, 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 loc.gov slash folklife, F-O-L-K-L-I-F-E. And all of those information is in your packets, by the way. A lot of this information is in your packets, so you're quite welcome to contact us. Thea has final announcements. Yes. So um, there are, as, as um, your glorious leader here has told you, there are three buses. One, one group of people is going to be staying behind a little bit and I, um, waiting for the last bus, and I urge you to take a look at the Civil Rights History Exhibit. That's one floor up on the second floor. If you're going to be staying here for a little while longer, hang back a little bit and let the people who are going to be exiting the building first go through the door. We have a couple of staff people to help you either take the elevator or take the stairs. There's one exit. Um, and we'll help you get back to the Folger where you got off the bus originally. So thank you again. Let's thank Guha for his presentation. Valda, Kathy, Kirst, all of the staff. That, thank you so much for coming. We really enjoyed presenting our collections to you today. And we hope that you'll come back and do research with the American Folklife Center at the library. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.